Okay, welcome back to another session at the round table. And here at the round table, we seek the truth, we speak the truth, and we live the truth, discussing biblical topics for everyday application. And I'm glad you could join me tonight. Um, in particular, this is a very interesting season. Um, we have um, four days from now, Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day, I would argue, is probably the most polarizing holiday in America. Why would you say it's polarizing? Because there's a positive and there's a negative, okay? I'd like to discuss, and so this discussion might go a little bit longer than what some, excuse me, what some of you would like. Some of you would like, you know, for me to stay within like 20 minutes. Usually I shoot for that. This may go a little bit longer, so if you have to pause it or have to go away for a little bit, I completely understand. But that disclaimer aside, um, let's get into this topic of love. We hear a lot about it. Country singers sing about a lot, at it a lot. Movies, in particular, highlight this subject. I mean, you can't even, I mean, watch a Disney movie without being exposed to at least one of those elements of love. We see Ariel falling for Eric in The Little Mermaid. We see the Beast and Belle in Beauty and the Beast suddenly, you know, fall in love. Aladdin and Jasmine in, a, in the movie Aladdin. Simba and Nala in The Lion King. We see all that um, happening today. Now, Valentine's Day is very polarizing because there's a positive side. On the plus side, you get to see people who have been together for however many years, say, look at us, look at what we're able to do. Ooh, look at this, on this day, we found each other. And, and this is a day I like to celebrate with my boo thing, as I'm not sure if they still say that nowadays, but, you know, some people will say they're my boo, my bae, my baby, or whatever the case may be. Um, but then on the other side... You have some of those, you know, and, and I've heard this guy uh, multiple times, and, and there was this, um, I went to this church, it was called Imago Dei Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the pastor highlighted a, a fact that is going to be true. For some of you singles, this is going to be a very hard Valentine's Day. Why? Because you haven't met anybody. Now, it could be you end up meeting someone on that day, who knows? Who knows what could happen? Um... And I'm not going to lie, that's the hardest thing for us singles to be. You know, when we see, you know, every time we see we see someone, like, all the people... Have you ever had that feeling where everybody around you is either engaged or dating or married? I know how that feels. Because a lot of the friends in my circles have either gone out on a date with someone gotten engaged, currently dating, or have married someone. It's hard. It really is. And, you know, I've had to battle this for a couple of years, and I was reminded this past Tuesday of a very interesting, um, a, a very interesting point. This is a verse you've heard me quote before. I feel it needed to be said again. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, it says this, and I'll, I'll quote it to you. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Did you catch that? But godliness with contentment is great gain. Well, how does that help me? How am I going to find my love? That's probably some of you are probably thinking that, and I would like for you to pause and think about what you just said or thought. How does that help me? I was reminded this past Thursday that, you know, um, I believe his name was Brian Davis. He came and spoke at our chapel this past Thursday, and he really hit a home run on this point. I mention this verse because a lot of times we don't understand how blessed we are oh but that's how can we be blessed we're not we don't even have a date i get that singles i do get that i do get it 
I mean, I understand how it how it feels because I have to wrestle with it almost every day. Every day I wake up knowing I'm still single. I was reminded, however, that do you really think that God is absent or he tunes himself out? No, absolutely not. What makes you say that? Well, the Bible says that heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. And the Bible also says, Jesus quotes in the New Testament saying, and a, even a sparrow, a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without him noticing. God notices the details. God doesn't, God doesn't just see the big picture about what's happening with nations and, and leaders. He looks at the individual's lives. He sees everything. All the details of your life, they're not hidden. He sees them. He sees your pain. He sees your wanting. He sees it all, guys. I'd like to also pose this. Some of us have really been wrestling with singleness. We're like, why hasn't this happened? Why am I still like this? Because, and I would propose a few thoughts. Could it be that perhaps maybe you've made an idol out of relationships? I'm just asking a question. Just look at your life and look at the and at the area of relationships. Do you think about that a lot? If you think about that a lot, it most likely means that that's where you're putting a lot of your thought and time into. The enemy of contentment is pride. Contentment cannot come because a person is focused on himself. I was reminded of that this past Thursday. The speaker said that the key to contentment is humility. Humility? Yep. The willingness to humble yourself. Singles, listen to me. In due time, it's going to happen. It's hard, I know. How can you say that? You probably, yes, I know. I've been in those spots. I've oftentimes wondered if God had plugs in his ears. You know, that like he doesn't want to hear my, my singleness. But at the same time, though, listening to what happened this past Thursday and then looking at my life, it's safe to say that, you know what, sometimes, you know, I, I kind of just put too much emphasis on relationships now, granted, does that, listen, I want to get married, yes, and I'm sure you singles want to get married too, but here's what we have to come to terms with. God knows. God is in control. Do you really think that this is, a, uh, this is a, something new for him? He's known about it all this time. He's got it all figured out. We just have to trust that, and it's hard, I know. It's hard. It really is. It is hard, but it's worth it. Why? Because I've noticed that when you are content in just living for God, doing his purposes, serving him, that in due time, God will bring the right person. Guys, he'll bring that right girl when the time is right. I was reading today in Matthew chapter 26. If you are familiar with Matthew 26, you would know that in that chapter, it's when Judas betrays Jesus. But before Judas betrays Jesus, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says this in verse 39. I'd like to read it to you. It's a, he says, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Verses later, he went back a second time. In verse 42, he says, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Jesus over and again asks God, the Father, don't let me go to the cross. He didn't want to do it. He prayed. God said no. Why? Because God loved us so much. He's like, this is the only... Basically... God's no to Jesus was basically saying, this is the only way to reconcile all of humanity back to me. I'm so moved by the kindness and the love that God has for 
people like us. I remember, I am reminded of the psalmist that says, Who, what is man that you are mindful of him? In other words, why would God care about us? He's perfect, we're not. God is so far above us. And, his, and you know what? Sometimes what we think is, oh, well, that's unfair. Well, keep, keep in mind, Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, this is God talking, by the way, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God does not think like we do. He's not limited. He's unlimited. He doesn't exist inside of time. He exists outside of time. So what we are panicking about, or what we're worried about, God's like, I got this all figured out. I got it. And over time, he begins to show us. Show us his will for our lives. And a lot of us, you know, we, we get impatient. I've had my fair share of impatience. Having to learn to be content is a daily struggle. It's a daily struggle for us all, and especially as Valentine's Day is four days out. We need to keep this in mind. To you that are single, if you are single at this moment, this is no accident that you're single. No accident at all. It's a sign. It means that God has you right where you are for a certain time in a certain place. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. If ever you're tempted to think about, oh, what I don't have, try focusing on what you do have. And while you wait for the Lord, get busy. Get busy serving Him. Share your faith with somebody. Lead a Bible study. Participate in small groups. Go serve the community. Singles, we've got, we've got time. For some of us, we may need to wait a little bit longer. That would include me and a few others. That, you know, we've, uh, we've got a lot of, to think about but and to, you know, prepare for. Whenever it's God's timing and God's will, it will happen. Ladies... That man will come when God says it's time. Guys, that girl will come along when it's time. Okay? Singles, remember to be content. Stay content and keep it. And, and, uh, there have been posts on social media in the past that, you know, as I think about it, they're not accurate. Like some people will say, oh, this is my, my man. Uh, my, uh, like the girls will say, oh, this man is my rock and he, he holds me tight. Or this man says, oh, this girl is my rock. No. Very bad. Very bad warning. No, no, no. You don't want to call that person your rock. Oh, but that's a compliment. Yeah, but it's, it, you kind of put a lot of odd on them. You never want to make the focal point or the foundation of your life around one person. Because guess what? That person's human like you. And they're going to make mistakes that are going to hurt you. Jefferson Bethke put it this way. If you're relationship is or if your marriage is resting in anything but Jesus it's resting in something broken okay because we human beings are broken people guys if you're looking for that perfect girl to make your life better there is no such thing as a perfect girl you're going to get disappointed a lot and got and ladies if you're looking for that perfect guy to come and sweep you off your feet and just be your rock well no, newsflash that man's not out there. How do you know? Because Jesus is supposed to be your foundation. He's supposed to be the one you trust in, not another person. The problem with our culture is we have we put relationships on on the pedestal, and we think, oh, if you don't have this, and you're missing out, and you know, listen, 
and I am not against dating and relationships. I'm not against marriage. I'm not against that. Please don't misunderstand me. But the way that the culture plays this out, it almost makes us makes it look like, oh, unless you have this, you're not welcome or you're just weird. Well, I think we as believers, keep in mind, we as believers don't live by the standards of the, of the world. If Ladies, if your man isn't out there yet, well, then guess what? He's not out there yet. Be patient. Seek the Lord, and in time he'll come. Guys, same thing. I'm, I'm talking to the singles because Valentine's Day is all, can also be known as Single Appreciation Day. At least that's what people are starting to call it. I like to just call it Valentine's Day. To call it Single Appreciation Day would kind of come from a place like, oh, well, we really need to make sure that uh, we as singles get recognized because we're single. It sounds like it's an invitation to a pity party. Now, granted, maybe some of you are like, I'm not being pitiful of my relationship status. I, I get that. Some of you are proud to be single, and I, that's good. That's good. But, and, and even 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says that each man must, you know, he said, I would like for all men to be as I am. And who, what was Paul? Paul was single. Paul didn't marry. And then what happened? He's like, because of, he's like, because there's so much immorality, each man should have his own wife. And he even said, if you can't control your lustful passions, then you should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So if you're burning with lust, be patient. The Lord will bring you the right person. I want to, uh, um, I want to kind of touch on some points, um, and this may be a little bit of a hard, kind of a hardball. But it comes from concern. You that are dating, what does it look like? What does your relationship look like? Are you is God at the center of your relationship? Yes, He is. Okay. I need to ask you this question though, and this and 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 because uh, I've noticed this is what is happening when you're dating or when people like a man and a woman they start dating and yes they fall in love and they they really love each other. Then some, not all, but some will make this move and they'll actually move in with the other person. I don't think that's a wise move. Why is that not? Everybody else is doing it. Follow the logic. If you call yourself a believer, what does the Bible say we are to be? Look at Matthew 5. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. In other words, you bring flavor. But if salt is for salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And then he goes on to say, You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. He goes on to say, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. A believer must stand out. A believer must be different. If you are living with someone that you're not married to, first off, what does that what does that imply? In in the American culture, it implies if you're living together, then you're sleeping together. That's called adultery. Two unmarried people sleeping together? That's adultery. What? Mm-hmm. You didn't did not wait till after marriage. The Bible is quite clear on the order. In Genesis 2.24, I broke this down a, a couple years ago. And it specifically says, it says in verse 24, it says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Apparently, people skip out on the middle part of that verse. They, the, the way the culture reads it is, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and the two will become one flesh. That's how the culture wants to read it. But how it's read in Scripture, the biblical way, 
First man leaves his father and mother. You Man, get out on your own. Number one. Number two, be united to your wife. Notice the wording the Bible uses. It uses the word unite and it uses the word wife. Wife is a specific term to define a woman that the man is married to. And united implies that he has been brought to the woman or they've been brought together through one process of unification, i.e. marriage, a wedding. And then finally, the last part of the verse says, then the two become one flesh. In other words, the two can go to bed together after the wedding. After the wedding. Hebrews 13.4 says, the marriage bed must be honored by all, uh, the, the, vow, the marriage vow must be honored by all, and the marriage bed be kept pure. The idea here, guys, is if you are a believer and you're living with someone you're not married to, you are dimming your witness. The world is going to look at you and say, well, what's different about you? That is how you need to look at your life. As a follower of Christ, you do not get to decide how to do things. You need to first consult the Bible and what it says. To do something without consulting the scripture is direct disobedience to the Lord himself. And I'm, and I, and I'm stressing this because it really chaps apps me. It really gets me irritated when I see people that knowingly profess Christ, yet they're living with someone they're not married to. One that's going to cause new believers to fall into sin, and much worse, probably get sucked into the culture. That's a, that's a big problem right there. You have no idea who you could be influencing. Second, who are you trying to draw attention to? You're certainly not trying to draw attention to God. You're just drawing attention to yourself. Look at how good my life is. Listen, I, dating couples. If you're going to be in a relationship, first you need to put God at the center. And if you've already moved in with somebody, I recommend you move out. Oh, but that's not convenient, but it's the right thing to do. If you love God, if you want to do it His way, then you'll move out. You're not going to live with that person unless... Pull everyone else down with you. As a believer, you're supposed to stand out. You're supposed to be different. There's something that should mark you as a weirdo. Oh, but I don't like being called a weirdo. But you need to get used to it. Because in in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, I'd like to read you that verse because I think we oftentimes look at life too much and we think oh yeah we need to live in this world and yeah we need to live in this world but we can't be a part of this world in verse 11 it says dear friends i urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Do you see what Peter is saying to the church there? He's saying, guys, as aliens and strangers in this world, abstain from sinful desires. In other words, stay out of it. Don't get involved with it. Whatever the world's do I mean, even Paul. Paul said to the church in Rome in Romans 12 too. He said, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. So that you may test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I think we, uh, we as the body of Christ, we, whenever it comes to love, we've got to handle it the biblical way. We do not need to do, oh, I'll do whatever. No, no, don't do whatever. Do it God's way. If you do it God's way, you're certainly going to stand out. You may get called weird. People may think you're crazy. But it's worth it. Why? Because you're trying to make a statement. I'm doing it God's way. And I want to tell you about the God I serve. What an opportunity for evangelism. 
I'm in an evangelism class right now, and let me tell you something. I'm reading some of the books, and I can't help but get excited. I'm honestly excited about sharing my faith again. I mean, yeah, I'm, I, I am a little nervous, but a couple of things I've read from some of the evangelism books I've read from certain professors, and let me tell you something. What an encouragement it has been. Part, and there are actually two types of evangelism. There's initiative evangelism and lifestyle evangelism. But I'll get into that in a different video. The point I want to make here is when it comes to the topic and the area of love, particularly when it comes to dating and relationships, we as believers ought to want to do it God's way. Not our way, not the world's way, God's way. So if you're dating, let me tell you this. Set up boundary lines. I've already set mine up. I'm not dating anybody, but should I date someone, I've got the lines in place so that we don't cross them. That's what you need to do. And by the way, if you're single, you got time. So be, be thinking about the standards you want to set. And then, you know, if when you meet someone, you get to talk about that. Talk about why you want to do it this way. If you're dating someone, it's not too late. Go ahead and let them know, hey, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and this is how I want to do. I want to do it God's way. And if they give you, if they fuss at you or say, well, that's not very comfortable. I don't understand why you're doing that. Then that's not the person for you. Because if they don't respect how you want to handle dating and relationships, they don't need to be in your life. To the married, you that are married, boy, it's tough. I can remember um, I've seen marriages end abruptly. I have heard of marriages struggling because of affairs. There are so much, you know, the devil is going to throw so much at you. And sometimes you may, if the marriage isn't going well, sometimes you'll use work or some other sideshow hobbies to bury those things instead of talking it out with your spouse. Husbands, wives, if you have been married and still remain married today, then I want to praise God. Thank you very much for being faithful to your vows before God and before man. It is truly a testimony because it speaks to who you love first. You love God because you made a promise that you would stay with that woman, guys, or ladies. You've made a promise you'd stay with that man. My mom and dad, their marriage almost didn't make it past the first year. But by God's gracious hand, he kept them together. In the words of Billy Graham, there are three people that occupy the relationship the husband, the wife, and God. Three people in a marriage. God is the one that holds them together. I, Joe, and I've heard a lot of other people put it like this. Um, look at this at a triangle. So God is up here. Here's the husband. Here's the wife. By growing closer to God, both husband and wife will draw closer to God. They'll get closer to each other. And you, you'll see when you draw it out. But, so all that to be, all that said, married, stay faithful. Stay faithful to each other. Why? Because your marriage is a example and can be a testimony to how God worked in your lives. And it can also bring someone closer to Christ. Did you think about that? Marriage can be used as an evangelism tool. A way for you to say, hey, God brought me and my wife together. He, would, he did it in a way I would never have guessed it. What a way to share the faith with somebody. To talk about how God brought you both together and kept you together. But let me, let me go back around to the singles for a minute. If you are, if you're wondering, well... Where's that person that gives me hope? Well, guess what? The Lord is your hope. 
I've mentioned that already, but I think it needs to be mentioned again. Singles. Our foundation is not found in another person. It's found in Christ. I hope you see that. I hope and pray that you do. Before we close today's um, discussion here at the round table, um, I want us to pray. We're going to pray as Valentine's Day approaches, and I'm going to pray for you. Um, there was a lot said tonight, um, but I think I want, I want to take this moment to pray for you specifically. So with all our heads bowed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for giving us life today, for giving us breath in our lungs. The fact that we are breathing and living is a sign of how good and gracious you are. The fact that we can stand on our own two feet shows that how good you are. We're able to stand because of you. We're able to walk because of you. We're able to see because of you. You have given us so much to be thankful for. You've given us a house. You've given us eyes to see, ears to hear, tongue to taste, nose to smell. You've given us friends and family. Father, I pray, f A, for the people that are going to be, um, you know, for the singles, in particular for the day of Valentine's Day. Father, this day can be very hard for them. And it can be hard for me and, and a lot of us. We, we, don't, we don't have that special someone in our lives. But that's okay. I pray we use this moment as a mark of contentment. That we would rest in you. That, you know, when we ask why, 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 that we would rest on your promises and take assurance from your word knowing that you've got all things under control and that things will happen according to your will when you decide. We put that area in your hands. Forgive us, Lord, for putting relationships on the altar and, and, and saying that, oh, it's so great, we need to have a relationship and we need to be married. We don't need to put anything ahead of you. I pray and I ask you to forgive us of our idolatry for the times we have put relationships ahead of you or focused on things that are not of you. I pray, God, that, that you would correct our thinking, that you would draw us to your word in the midst of this time. I pray for those that are dating and, and married, and you know, it's, it's special for them. It's special, God. Uh, because, you know, they get to celebrate a, a day of love with someone they love. And, you know, that's cool. And it's great. I pray for those that are dating that they would set boundaries and not cross them. And those that are, you know, living in, in situations that are dishonoring to you, I pray you convict them and that you move them to obey your word. I pray for the married couples. I pray, God, that they would remain faithful to you and faithful to each other. And by doing so, that they would be a light to this world and share your love with those in need. I pray for those that are, you know, they've had a loved one die or maybe, you know, they got widowed or divorced or however the case may be. But I pray for those that are hurting. It's not easy, especially on today. I pray for comfort for them, for peace that can only be found in you. Let us look to you this Valentine's Day and remind ourselves of who is on the throne and who is in control, no matter what our circumstances or situations bring. We put ourselves in your hands and we ask that your kingdom come and your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you all have a great evening and may God bless you.